I say, it's just, we're just, we've been waiting until it's about 2008 for this moment, because um, we sort of first saw SUP in the States um, back then, and as a brand, we were like, wow, this is, this is going to, you know, take off, and a lot of people are going to get involved, and um, it's, it's been a real slow burn, a really slow burn. So to get to this point where I'm talking to you this evening about the kit that we do, and particularly paddling through the shoulder in the winter seasons, um, I can't tell you just how excited we are as a brand to talk to you as a community about that. So um, that's, that's really good news. Just to introduce myself, I'm Paul Robertson. I'm the marketing manager for Palm Equipment. I've been with the company for about 17 years, and prior to that as a, as a pro paddler as well. Um, my background is in product design. I'm also um, an ex-teacher um, and I'm just a paddler. Um, and so I get on the water doing all sorts of activities, particularly I've been a background in whitewater kayaking, surf kayaking, uh, canoe paddling, um, but I kind of cross disciplines. My job within the company, apart from just the obvious promotion, socials, marketing, catalogues, shows and that kind of stuff, is also being firmly embedded in the product design process. And at Palm, that's been the kind of core emphasis of the brand um, since day one, since the founder, who's still the owner, still operational in the business, Andy Knight, founded the company. Um, he wanted better gear for paddlers. Um, and that's exactly what we're still doing over 40 years later as a brand. So we are a one-stop shop. We're probably about the biggest in Europe. We manufacture under the Palm clothing and apparel brand, which we supply top to toe, whether you're a first time or an expert, we do all of that for you for paddle sports. We also do search and rescue equipment. And then we operate a number of other brands. We manufacture kayaks also in Cleveland in Somerset. So we do dagger and wilderness kayaks. We don't do boards, we don't do paddles because there's some really good ones out there. So we let everyone else do those ones, but everything else we do as a brand, um, as Palm Equipment, we sell um, through retailers across the UK and, and worldwide. Um, so we're a manufacturer and a wholesaler. Um, and we are quite unique as well because we actually, unlike many clothing brands, we actually also own our manufacturing facility. It's in Asia, it's in Vietnam, um, but unlike a lot of other businesses which have their products just manufactured by other people, we're an owner of a factory. So we're responsible, not least for employee welfare in that instance, but also we can get really ingrained in the process, making sure our samples that we work on with those guys go through to production and above all, that quality is really high. And when you're making paddle sports equipment and the standard Standard and the safety gear particularly that we do you need that level we're, we're not interested in things you see where people are coming out of containers in the morning having slept in them working 12 hours you don't get good product that way which is why we invested in a factory in Vietnam as a brand about 11 years ago now so that's a little bit of background to Palm we're a product-led business um, but also from an SUP point of view we're learning as you go along as well so there's, it's, it's an evolving market there's a lot of expertise that we bring to the table but there's also knowledge that we're gaining so you know we really appreciate you as a community talking dialogue it's a really nice friendly open community and the guys at War Skills of course are you know, leaders of that so we're really proud to partner. Um, our design process, um, we're kind of constant in that. So, you know, for example, we had a design product meeting yesterday. We're looking right now at products of 2022, 2023, even 2024. So we're developing that far ahead. And it works very well, particularly with video conferencing. We've been using that for about seven years because Barney lives over in the States. He's our lead designer, but we, we have a few others who do some speciality goods. And so he can evolve products get them over to our factory in Vietnam and work it that way. So I'll let Barney just describe a little bit about what he does and the design process before I get into talking about the gear. Great, thanks Paul. Um, yeah, <clears throat> my name's Barney Caulfield. Um, I've been involved with Palm since I left university in 1998. So there's a lot of people who've worked a long time at Palm, which is great because it allows us to see things through all the way to the very, very end. Um, I took a couple of years out in the early 2000s and came and worked for Confluence Water Sports, who are a large, um, very large manufacturer of kayaks here in um, the east coast of the States. Um, I stayed here, but managed to get back together with, um, with Palm when Paul uh, joined. So I kind of rejoined. Um, that would have been mid 2000s, I think 2005. And I've been with them again ever since. Um, and I think the reason people stay so long with Palm and they're prepared to give so much to Palm is it's a great company to work for. Um, you know, we and the daily challenges are fantastic. You know, we design or I design everything you pretty much you see in the workbook, all the clothing. Um, so one day I can be making a life jacket or designing life jackets. The next day I can be designing shoes, uh, socks. Um, I've even designed inflatable kayaks <laughs> as well. So get to do all kinds of stuff. And, and it's great. And I'm a keen kayaker. I've been kayaking since I was in the Scouts. Um, 
love the outdoors here in North Carolina, very lucky to live uh, close, live in the woods, very close to the Green River, for example, um, really good white water, uh, great mountain biking, uh, good, good, fairly good skiing. Um, so yeah, it's great. I like to get out in the outdoors and feed all that information back into, back into Palm. And as Paul says, kind of, we currently, I currently work remotely and they'll work very closely with the uh, R&D department in Vietnam. And uh, yeah, we just kind of keep cranking out, just keep making good gear. That's, that's what we try and do. Um, I'll turn back over to Paul. I think Paul will probably do most of the talking, but if there's any um, technical uh, questions about gear design, then I'll, I'll chip in. Thanks, Barney. So as I sort of alluded to at the start, we, we've been sort of, if you like, waiting for this time where essentially you know, SUP's done a fantastic job of um, displaying itself. We were really sort of recognised as, as, as an activity. It's, it's, it's hugely inclusive um, and it means that an awful lot of people have got into it. It's a really accessible way to get on the water to enjoy the outdoors. Um, and yet one of the things that we've sort of um, found a, a challenge, if you like, is that people have really retained it primarily for summer use. And as people have been paddling in different forms for, for well, since our, our, our sort of young years, our teens, we've done it all year round. It's always been an all year round activity for us. We just don't stop. There's some fantastic times we had on the water, be it out on the ocean or in land for all four seasons. So, so really it's, it's, it's really encouraging to know that people right now are going, I've had a great time joining SUP in the summer. I've been doing it for some years and now I just want to extend my seasons. I want to keep going right way through the year. And you can, you know, you absolutely can, but you do need to take a few more thoughts into your head and, and a few more sort of, preparations if you like in terms of what you're going to do on the water and prepare in terms of some of your equipment and your thoughts going forward so that's what we're going to a little bit of talk about how you get protected on the water comfort making sure you've got adaptable kit your safety of course as well and I guess the seasons I'm going to talk about mostly with the equipment are the shoulder seasons which we describe as sort of se September or October and then again probably sort of February, March, April, probably more March, April, May almost, depending whether you're north or south. And then that depth of winter period, so you call it talking December, January, February. Um, I think really for you as individuals, um, you've got to ask yourself what sort of paddling you're doing. Are you an active paddler or are you a more passive paddler or, or what sort of paddling you're going to do on the day? Because that really informs what you're going to need in terms of your equipment. So, you know, really active paddlers, race paddlers, people who are training, uh, people perhaps who are doing white water. If you're in the surf, you're moving, you're intensely moving. So you're going to generate more heat, you're more, more active in your water use. Whereas a more passive paddler doesn't mean to say you're not being active, but you'll tend to be kind of maintaining a, a more steady cadence, perhaps in your paddling, so more recreational touring it could be coaching as well coaching often you end up mo not moving too much and then moving a bit quite quickly to show your group so passive and active what what sort of paddling are you doing what's your work rate and what what duration of paddle are you going on that day so uh, you know are you going to raise your sweat um, or are you going to be kind of needing to actually think about your insulation levels so thinking about heat and how we lose and retain heat is, is a really important factor when you're choosing your equipment Conducting, losing heat through conduction, so contact, of course, your feet, of course, are in contact, your hands are on a paddle. Conductive loss of heat, um, it doesn't count for too much, but it factors right up as soon as garments get wet. So you, you can lose a lot through conduction when it gets wet, which is why sometimes, for example, a wetsuit, which is perfect in the surf zone, isn't necessarily always the best thing to choose if you're going out actually in wind and stood up and you're not actually in the water there's other choices you could make there it's good gear but you could look at some other things radiated heat loss is like literally if your body's working you're going to basically shed heat out and that's going to escape at what rate is it going to escape convection is air movement so wind chill is a really big factor stand-up paddlers probably get it more than anyone other than perhaps wind surfers you're, you're, you're just exposing your whole self to the the, the elements so you need to protect yourself top to toe with that and evaporation of course you're sweating you know you might have wet or damp clothes if they chill down how does that affect you so you need to prepare and protect yourself for that and of course in the most in you know, the heavy instances of that right in the depths of the winter it can be really cold water so what you know what are our risks and our conditions to the, the that you're going out in as well so water temperature is probably the biggest one across the shoulder in the winter seasons it's when it changes the most so sea state i mean summertime it might be 15 degrees plus in the sea 
but in the winter it can come right down to six to ten you get that really cold feel but inland water can go further than that so you know in, in the summer that might go right up in temperature because it might be a still body of water but at this time of year i'm up here in scotland all the locks are frozen so those temperatures are well down to zero so if you go in the water at that point cold water shock could be a real issue that you need to think about and deal with with what you're wearing because if you're not wearing the right stuff it can affect your life put simply so water temperature water state big conditions so is it calm out there is it going to stay calm is it choppy have you got waves to deal with is the flow on the water that you're dealing with well what's the water state you're going to go out with the weather as well so you know is it raining is it windy is the sleet you know weather patterns move much more quickly in the winter time or across the shoulder seasons that's when traditionally you get the whole weather systems coming across the atlantic to the uk i think most of you around the uk so i'll sort of talk in those terms um, so you need to remember those conditions are going to move move quickly and of course your geographical location i'm in scotland it's a damn sight cold over here than it is down on the south coast with anyone that's down there at the moment so just think about preparing what's the weather forecast what it's looking like what's the water conditions get to know that your local waterway that you might go out on in the summer might be completely different in the winter so be aware that things change and change quite rapidly prepare for that i mean in paddle sports for years we've just been taught 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 just just to prepare for eventualities it sounds a bit doomsday so i don't mean to scare anyone with that but it, it is worth just reflecting on it in the equipment that you choose so that's what i'm going to move now move into but a bit of background about what you should think about how you're using your gear what sort of session you're having so let's start with shoulder seasons as i say they're september october march april depending how, how north south you are what type of year we've had so shoulder season to us is a time where your kit transitions quite a lot you've gone from probably having your subordies on for the summer you know maybe just a really light top if at all you don't really need much on the board you're having just a great time it's you know the water's clear happy days but into that shoulder season things can start moving so one of the things that we start looking at is a, is a little bit of layering in this and first and foremost probably what i'd um, pick out for people to, to think about is is a wicking base layer um first thing any kit on the water just no cotton just leave cotton at home don't wear a cotton t-shirt it's no good don't wear cotton socks just cotton and water just no leave it alone so you want something like this which is a it's a polyester you could look at a merino um, there are more and more recycled materials coming into this so they're not all just man-made fibers um, but something like this will wick moisture away from you so if you start building up sweat inside it'll pull it to the outside it won't sit on your skin so if you cool down it won't be sitting there and cool you down with it so a good wicking base layer is something to look out for this one's got sort of like a hydrophilic membrane which actually actively pulls water out so a good good base layer in there you may then want to add on top of that in a shoulder season and it might be something you keep in a bag you might not be wearing all the time but sort of a, a good sort of weight um fleece so your wicking layer is probably going to be about 170 grams something like that you want to look for in something like this you're probably looking at sort of 250 270 maybe up towards 300 you can get these sort of everywhere i mean of course we make them as palm but um you know a fleece like this is well worth having in your bag you know something maybe that you could open and vent is really good idea look out for things like a waffle pattern or something like that in the inside because what that will do is it will trap air inside in there and it'll keep you warm so a good a good mid layer that you can either chuck on or just wear from the outset is worthwhile you get them with hoods good outdoor brands will have them we, we make one here with polygene and a, and, a, and a fancy italian fleece but that's a pretty good piece to have as might be something like a gilet that's a really versatile piece it's not just for golf courses they're good in the outdoors because it keeps your core warm. Your core, of course, is this area, this rectangle from your hips, basically up to your shoulders. And that's the bit you really need to keep warm if you're paddling in the shoulder seasons and of course in the winter. Now, what about your kind of legs in that time? You've, you, you've put a top on, we'll come back to jackets in a minute. Legs at this point, you might then sort of have a look at something like a, a short you might be wearing your board shorts already but you can go a little bit more fancy with that so something like this one is a windproof and a waterproof outer fabric so that means you're not, not going to get that cool wind chill going on it covers down to over the knees this is the horizon short but what these sort of shorts do is they hide a little detail which is a really neat fleece inner um, and that basically means that because that's protected from the wind, you get insulated, but you're still kind of, you're still free to move around. So it's a really good shoulder seasons piece. So a line short, or you might look at a really thin neoprene legging, like we make a Neoflex, and that's a, a 0.5 millimeter legging. 
something like this one. It's like a sort of halfway between a kind of active pants like that. If it's still warm, you could wear one of those, but like a thin neoprene like this, it's really stretchy and it'll work well if it's wet or dry. When you start going up in thicker neoprene, it's better if that's wet because you get a little bit more dexterity in it. I also, in a shoulder season, still quite often might wear just a neoprene top like this one, particularly if I'm doing a quite active session or if I know I'm in the water. This is also Neoflex. So this is a, this again is a really thin neoprene. It's super stretchy. It's really comfortable to wear. You don't feel restricted. It's a good shoulder season piece to have, um, especially if you're kind of quite active around the water. But if you're stood around a long time in these sort of things, and you've not got anything else on, and if the wind's coming a little bit, you will cool down in this sort of garment. So once you choose whether you're going to go for more of a base layer and a mid layer, or stick with a neoprene in the shoulder season and a top, you may then want to start thinking about the next pieces, which is a windproof or a waterproof smock, um, something that's going to kind of keep the wind off primarily. Weather changes in the shoulder seasons quite a bit. So as I say, something that might keep the rain off, but primarily you're going to protect yourself from the wind. Have a look out for things which have got a low back. So it covers down there. So if you are sitting down, it's covered. And again, try and keep an eye out for ventilation. To keep it nice so you can get a nice open front you can let air escape if you are getting hot but at the same time you can cinch it back up and close it down now you know what in many cases if you've got just a normal sort of hill jacket a two and a half layer two layer hill jacket that you use it's just your general waterproof that'll do the business to be honest with you um just to kind of give you an explanation of what a kayaking jacket is or a, a paddle sports jacket perhaps more importantly some of the feature sets that you might start seeing would be closure around the waist you get a, a, a much more contained closure often it's a neoprene it just means it seals it up a little bit more similarly you tend to get more of a cinch to the neck so we're trying to create a, a semi-dry seal around here so you'll get often again a neoprene or a coating around the neck and that lets you get a really nice closure and cinch that up if you're, if you're in colder conditions and critically also you tend to get a thicker wrist this one here is a neoprene and it's indeed it's much wider which means that when you've got the tunneling that happens on your wrist if you clench your wrist it stops water coming through so kind of the, the little details that make a paddling jacket versus just a, an everyday outdoor jacket start defining themselves at, at this point definitely something to have a look out for would be a hood. Um, this is our Vantage jacket. This is, this is probably from a, a set point of view our best seller um, just because it works for pretty much all the people all the time. It's a two and a half layer jacket. It's got the hood, it's got the front zip. You'll notice here how the front zip is offset and this is where you start seeing in the kind of slightly more premium pieces and that's the reason for that is if you zip it right back you can open and clip that back to venting and when you zip it right up it doesn't interfere so that zip doesn't come right up on your chin so you're paddling away that's not getting in the way you've got a good venting space you can really cinch that up and in that shoulder season it's raining a bit of wind chill you want to be able to just chuck this on they pack up really neatly you can roll them into the hood stick them in your dry bag pull them out pull them on some people tend to go for a slightly larger size of this and that's simply because they can put it on over everything it's like a smock um, so think about that when you're choosing a garment, what are you going to be wearing underneath? Think about the layers that you're going to need to build up underneath. So, so you get some air that can trap inside. If it's too close and too tight, you know, you can cool down because it's going to get that conducted chilling in there a little bit. So those are some of the shoulder season pieces that you might have. Um, what about um, PFDs? I'm going to talk a little bit through PFDs. Primarily, of course, I'm talking about protection from wind chill, from water. But as we get into these shoulder seasons, um, you really need to think that what a PFD can do to you beyond its obvious choice, which is to save your life because it's in the water and it keeps you afloat. So throughout the sort of summer seasons, the shoulder seasons, you may well go for an inflatable waist belt rather like this. In fact, people use these all year round. It's a, it's a PFD basically in a bag. And if you have a moment where you're in the water, you need a bit of support, you want your PFD, you pull the toggle, it inflates, it comes over the top like that. But it is just in there, keeps you nice and free, and it's nice and low profile. However, as you start getting to those colder times, you definitely probably want to be looking at what we call an inherent foam PFD. Now, and the difference in that is that all the flotation is ready to go. You wear it just like a jacket, you put it on, it might have a zip up the front like this one, or it might be a vest style. You put it on, do it up, as we've got here. Most of you probably see these, or familiar with them, or probably have got them already. 
But once you've got this on, once you've got this zipped up, I've got this one a bit tight, you have got an extra layer of insulation. So not only if you go in the water is it going to keep you afloat, but that extra insulation, about inch and a half, two inches of foam, is going to keep you nice and warm in the core area. You're still free to move all the way around here, but your core can stay warm. So think about a PFD, particularly in the winter and the shoulder seasons, about making sure you've got an inherent foam PFD. Plenty of different ones out there that you can get. You can go right up the scale, lots of bells and whistles. I'll show you one later, or you can just keep it nice and simple. Um, like this one, which is the Meander. So I've covered kind of some of the shoulder season, season gear. What about um, feet? What about extremities, hands, gloves, that kind of thing? Well, you, you're probably not going to need them too much at this point, but you may need to start thinking about something like a neoprene boot, a light neoprene sort of sock, something like that. Obviously, not everyone wants to wear um, one of those on a board. And in the summer, you've probably been quite used to being barefoot on the board. You get that feeling up through your feet. But as it gets colder, often you're going to get water across that area. It's one of the areas will definitely start feeling cold. And if, if you start feeling cold on your hands, on your feet, you've probably all, all felt this. Um, it just, it ruins your day. And it can, you know, if you're going a distance, it can become really uncomfortable. So as you move into the shoulder season, start thinking about a boot and also probably start thinking about wearing it a few times, just so you get familiar with having that under your foot. I would definitely be looking at something like this one, which is, which is a fairly sort of thin two and a half, three millimeter neoprene boot. It's really flexible and dexterous. Um, those sort of boots that you can get like this one, the paw, um, they have a thermofiber lining inside, so you can stay nice and nice and insulated with that one. However, you're still going to get a good feel to the board and your feet are going to be warm because those can go cold really quickly. I would say in the shoulder seasons, you're not necessarily going to need too much. You probably won't need to be worrying about gloves unless you do suffer from cold hands a little bit more, in which case something like a fingerless glove is a, is a good choice because it just keeps the, the cool off the back of the hands. Um, and then other kit that I'd probably be ready for, just have a dry bag ready, put it on the front of your board and have in there, you know, a hat, a drink, just some of the things that are just going to get you warm. It might be where you store your jacket. You may just want to put that mid layer fleece in there. So the things that allow you to be adaptable and change to layer up or layer down as the conditions demand. Um, but those are the sort of shoulder season pieces that I'd, I'd sort of be looking out for. So think good wicking base layer probably a windproof waterproof jacket, definitely starting to think about some wind protection or covering your legs as well so you don't chill down through there, keep your core nice and warm and take a few extras just to kind of make sure you're protected and wear a buoyancy aid. So now let's get into the nitty gritty of the depths of winter and you know some of you may have put your boards up on the shelf and just gone no no I'm, I'm done for the year I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that there and I pick it up again in the spring and fair play that 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 that's not unreasonable but it can be great you know I, I paddled recently I live on near the river Spey um it was a still day it was really there was snow on the ground there was ice on the trees but it was beautiful and I just had the greatest day on the water so you know don't dismiss the idea that in the winter you can get out and have some great paddling but you do need to prepare in the depths of the winter because things are cold and you just need to be, like I said, ready and think about what sort of activities you're doing and have some precautions in place. So um, you basically take the, the, the essentials that I've just talked about and we start building them up. So you definitely want that wicking base layer that's going to move any sweat away from you. Get that on first of all. You'll then almost certainly need to be looking at a mid layer over the top, making sure that's a full arm coverage coming down a good sort of 300 gram fleece or something like that. I would, I would personally probably be moving away from neoprene tops at this point, unless I'm actually in the water from in the surf zone, or I'm going to be wearing a winter suit, a long arm winter suit. We don't make them at Palm because there's some amazing surf brands doing some really good flexible stuff. Um, so we don't get into that market, but if you are in the surf zone, you're well served and you know what you're doing in that respect. But if you're out and you're stood up on your board all day or a little bit longer, it probably isn't as comfortable in a, in a full neoprene suit. So think layering, think as if you're gonna go for a hike or something like that. So get that base layer on, get that mid layer on. You also may want to start thinking if you're moving on to having something across your legs as well. So that's when a piece like this one comes in, it's the onesie. And these are just like absolute, just you know, a bundle of love. It's like a massive hug, they only get one of these on. 
it's the same midway weight fleece, um, so it's a, it's a real stretch garment. But of course, the benefit of a onesie is that because it's a one piece garment, you don't get that possible separation where you get that cold spot often in your back when you're moving between the two halves. So that's the beauty of the onesie. And to be honest with you, if it's a sort of a cold Sunday and you just want to watch Netflix, you can put this on and sort of sit there at home as well. So, you know, the onesie is a real winner for everybody as long as you wash it. The good news for us is that we treat ours with polygene, which is uh, anti-odor treatment so you should you shouldn't be too stinky when you sat there at home wearing one of these um, we do men's and women's versions of this um, and these particularly are combined with dry suits which i'll show you in, in a while so men's versions have a, a two-way zipper on them and then the women's version have what we call a bomb door at the back which is basically this whole piece comes up and over like that and then if you need to you can drop that down to come go with your um, dry suit but definitely a onesie as a layering piece is really good you still wear your wicking layer underneath it um okay so what about um legs in the winter time um i want to talk a little bit to tell you a little bit about dry trousers and jackets because i've seen a few things mentioned by people online at the moment who are sort of talking about them um, so let's just explain that so this here is a paddling dry pant so what makes that different if you go into your sort of mountain um warehouse or if you go into sort of i don't know cotswold or something like that and buy, buy a walking um pair of um, waterproof trousers which will work um uh, i won't put that past them but why why is this a paddling pant well the first and obvious thing is this one here has got built-in dry socks now i mentioned about conducting and getting cold feet so straight away your feet are dry inside this the socks are built in a piece of fabric it's shaped with a heel section so your foot goes sliding in, it pushes to the end, this wraps up and fits in your, your foot, and then you've got a complete seal, dry feet inside. I'll come on to talk to you about the socks that you're gonna wear in that. So dry feet. We've moved as well, our fabrics that we're using the shoulder season, two and a half layer, two layer fabrics, you now move into three and four layer fabrics in the winter. And what do you start getting, just basic fabric knowledge for you, Two, two and a half layer, you've got your sort of, usually it's a nylon outer, it's a woven nylon outer, you'll have a, a waterproof coating on that, which is known as DWR, which is when you see the water beading off like that. And then you'll often have a breathable membrane in it. So that'll be, that'll be a, a two layer and a, and a half, two and a half layer has simply got a print on the back, which lets it just feel quite comfortable next to the skin. Three and four layer, you start including more membranes and you also include what we call a, a tricot backing. And the tricot backing in most cases is this sort of, this sort of grey surface you see on a lot of outdoor jackets, it might be black, and that helps actually insulate. You start building some insulation into the garment. So by going up to three layer garments in the winter, you're straight away getting a warmer garment to wear. It's going to protect you a little bit more. Now, going back to the features, this is a, as a, as a paddle sports pair of pants. You'll notice it's got this sort of funny waist, and this is a twin waist system. So what does that do? Well, first of all, your inner, this part here, is attached so it's all taped inside it's all sealed and this is going to sit really high kind of like a, a really old school pair of trousers right up underneath your sort of chest like this sort of wandering around but that means that water can't get down in there because it's up nice and high but what stops water flooding in because this is just elastic and this is really important is a really good waist seal and this is the difference between this an outdoor pant is that you get a really good waist seal velcro and neoprene just like the jackets and that cinches round and you can tighten that right up and you can get a fairly good seal to your waist there. So if you happen to go in the water, water's not gonna flood down in these. You're not gonna be basically with your sort of balloon pants on sinking down to the bottom because you've sealed it round the waist. So it's a really important distinction between a paddling pant, particularly in the winter and just a general outdoor trouser. It's, it's what designs a paddling pant. Further detail really is things like the cut. So in terms of its articulation, protection across the knee and shin area, not having a seamless crutch area so you can move freely as you're moving around on a board or on, on, on the bank or anywhere else like that. So look out for a paddling pant. These ones here, the Atom, do men's and women's ones, three layer pant. These have been really kind of taken off with a plum. Um, and I know, you know just, I know, speaking for ourselves a little bit here, um, we gave Cal Major when she was doing a land center on the groats, uh, sort of challenge with this one and she hadn't worn she'd always worn neoprene we're like look Cal 
put on this fleece, put on a pair of these, and it was like a revelation to her because suddenly she was warm, she was dry, she was still moving, and as she went in the water, she was just getting back out, and she was still dry, and it just made her days a hell of a lot happier, and so she set a record. So, yeah, dry pants, they're a good one. Now, the thing I saw recently was someone talking about combining a jacket and a dry trouser and calling that a dry suit. Now, just to kind of give you kind of Bit of parlance and terminology of that, we would call them separates and we would therefore call it at best a semi-dry system. So if you overlap these, I'm going to describe that to you, you do get the effect like a suit of a seal, but it's definitely not a dry suit. So don't, don't get convinced you bought a dry suit if you bought these two, but you definitely have a good experience with these. Because what you do is you take this inner waist and your outer waist, you then look at a jacket, which is quite often perhaps got a twin seal the same. So you've got an inner and an outer and you just overlap them one layer over the other. If one bit comes up high, the other bit goes up low. And as you can imagine, it becomes a seal. So you do get a pretty good dry seal. If you're just dropping in the water and getting back out, you're going to be pretty dry with that, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and it's particularly good for stand-up paddling in that respect. If you're immersed for a long period of time, yes, water can creep in there, so don't think it's a dry suit. But it's a good choice because you can have these if it's a bit warmer and perhaps another just a really light jacket. And then you can switch into a heavier weight jacket. So this is a three layer jacket now, got the full hood, you start building in lots of detail like you now start seeing things like latex seals coming in on the wrist, which means you get a really dry, you don't get any water coming in through your wrists. You'll have further sealing around the neck. So you'll start seeing that you can cinch up that. So you start looking at a jacket like this to pair up with a pant like that. So these are a really good adaptable piece for stand up paddling. Get this back up here. The other, um, only other piece I'd want to introduce, and this is definitely a favourite of the, uh, the Water Skills Academy team, um, are these ones. So, the, so this is basically a bib pant. Um, got a lovely set of braces in here, so you can sort of do, you know, pull, pull them out and see, see how you're getting on. Like, all right, we'll have a good chat. Um, but the benefit of these is just simply that they're exactly the same construction as you've got your dry pants. So it's the same three and a half, three layer fabric. You've got the same socks on those ones but the waist just comes right up here. So you can get further into the water. And of course they, they suspend themselves up and it helps with your core. So I know when the guys have been over and done the trips in Norway, or if they're paddling in this time of the year, they're often wearing this. And then they might just even just have, you know, on some days they might just combine it with a jacket like this that they're just banging that over the top. Or if it's, a, if it's a more challenging day, they might look at something that seals down a bit more. But again, a big pant like this one, the Atom Bib is a really adaptable piece. One thing to mention about these dry pants is the, you know, the socks on them are rather like car tires. They, they will wear out because of course they're next to your feet. They, you need to do your best to protect them. So please don't go, one, if you buy a set, don't just go wandering across a car park or something or a beach with them. Try and protect them, wear something so you're wearing a shoe over them. Um, we tend to find in the winter that you may need to think about um, something where you, know, you go up a size in your neoprene boot or if you're wearing a thicker sole, you might just take out the insole often. That's enough to just get in a little bit more volume and space with them. But those dry socks are designed so that they're just completely replaceable. So in the life of the product, you may well find that they'll need replacing just like you need to get a new set of tires on your car or whatever you think about those as a, as a replacement part and it's a really big thing this gear this gear does cost so you know we appreciate that so we engineer it Barney's job is to make sure that it's constructed and engineered in such a way that it has a really good lifespan you know in part, part of the whole sort of environmental aspect that we look at is well if we can make a product last a few more years that's better anyway than having to go and get a new one so we're looking at quality fabrics we're looking at quality construction things like the seams inside they don't have four points meeting so you don't have these crosses where they might get strained we just look at that and engineer that into the product and that's why things like the socks are designed so they can be replaced so you can just keep going with them so a couple of like maintenance things so if you ever need product servicing don't just give up on them they can keep going very often. Okay so now let's have a, a quick look we've talked, talked a little bit about jackets and the, and the seals you have let's get on to sort of the, 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 the big deal products like the um, dry suits. So definitely to choose a dry suit you, you've got to be pretty committed to paddling at this time of year um, or know that you're going to be kind of needing to be really protected from the elements 
Um, but it's a really good investment. I'd have to say that dry suits in about the last five or six years have just kind of shot like this in terms of people having them and using them. And I think the reason is, uh, you know, I found this myself, is that you put on a dry suit and you sort of put on this suit of armour and you just got this, you know that you're feeling fairly invincible from the elements because you're just sealed inside. You've got all your warm clothes inside. You've got your one piece suit. You've got your wicking base layer. Your core is going to be really warm. You're just going to have a very comfortable time. So dry suits, really, the difference is it's one piece all the way through. There's, there's no seam here in the middle. It's one way all the way through, which does mean to get in and out, you have to have a, a dry zipper like this one. Now, a dry zipper, give you some idea, it's probably about the most expensive component that we use in our, in our product. We use YKK because they make the best. Um, and what defines a dry zip, and you get these in dive suits and so on, is the way that the teeth mesh, so you don't get water coming through there. They're high pressure teeth that won't let water come through. And then most important, you get a seal at the end. This hoop at the end lets the zip close right in. Water can't get through there. So I undo the back of the suit, I climb in, oh, I can't get the zip open here, climb into the back of the suit, in I go, I seal that up, it's usually a buddy thing, you probably need a buddy to seal that up for you, it's sealed inside there, I have a dry neck seal, in this case it's a neoprene which means it's really nice and comfortable to wear, I've got latex on the inside of my wrist so there's no water going to come into that little piece, I've got a nice overcuff which is going to protect me. I can cinch up the neck and keep myself well baffled there. I've got my dry front, and I've got my dry socks. Now I brought in here today, I brought the women's version of this. Now this is to match up with that bond door I was talking to you about on the fleece garments. You'll see that this has got a really big hoop zip round here, which means you can use that to get, not get in, but you can use that to do your business if you ever need to. So this is the, the women's suit that we make here. Um, these are four layer suits. So these have got the most protective material that we can put in to these. And you start getting all the bells and whistles. So once you put your hand inside the pocket, you've got the fleecy backing in there. And the cut is just absolutely designed and articulated for paddling and for movement. So if you're paddling a lot at this time of year, it's a good investment. Um, yes, they cost a reasonable amount of money because there's a lot of construction and design that goes into these ones, but they'll last you a good number of years. And I know quite a few of the guys you know, who are watching um, Chris, who, who's one of the directors, are moving across to some of these because they're, they're paddling in their, their steamers, if they're surfing, but if they're out touring it's like this, this is the sort of garment that's equivalent to your sort of 5-3 winter suit with your hood built in. This is, this is the paddling equivalent of that. So that's why you choose a dry suit. So good investment, costs some money, but well worth it. And you'll love having one, absolutely love having one. So dry suit's a bit of a winner. All right, I'm going on a bit of a pace. So um, I'm just going to now talk in that winter period. I've talked about the kind of layering that you want to keep your core nice and warm. I've talked about protecting yourselves with windproof and waterproof legs, windproof and waterproof top, having a hood that you can cinch down, starting to get more sealing to your wrists, to your neck, so water just can't get it. So if you happen to go into the water in the depths of winter, you're not going to get cold water coming in. That'd be the worst thing. So you're staying dry. That's the point. Stay dry, stay warm, and then you can stay active and happy. But what about your extremities? I definitely suffer from cold hands and cold feet. So particularly in the winter, it's those accessories that can also make the day. And if you're using some of your shoulder season gear, it's some of the things you can just add quite simply to your mix of your product kit bag, and that'll help you be really comfortable. So let's start with feet. I mentioned about the neoprene boots earlier, um, but you probably want to be thinking probably about slightly higher neoprene boot. You definitely want to be looking at slightly thicker neoprene, or you want to be looking at neoprene such as this, which has got these sort of plush lining. Now this also helps water drain a little bit, but mostly it can also insulate. It traps a bit of moisture in there and warm air as well and it keeps you nice and warm so a good thick winter boot as I say get used to it so you're used to it on the board make sure you're well sealed up. Inside my dry suit or if I'm not wearing a dry suit I tend to use a really thin pair of neoprene socks like this one these are our sort of titanium lined socks these are these are 
really, really thin, so they don't get in the way. They're really, really stretchy, but they keep you nicely insulated. So I might just drop them inside my paddling shoe. Um, I definitely, I will wear them inside my suit. Sometimes I will also sometimes wear them outside to protect the suit as well, because they're just flexible enough. But a thin neoprene sock like this allows you to layer your footwear up. So you can put that inside a, a shoe or a boot and it'll keep you nice and warm. It obviously wouldn't work if you've got a split toe boot. So just keep that in mind if you're having a look. But these are, these are nicely shaped. The alternative is, of course, you just go for a, a fleecy sock. Um, you could wear a, a, a hiking sock or something like that inside a suit as well or inside a dry sock. So, you know, as long as it's going to keep your feet warm, but just be aware that you're, you're putting volume on your feet. So if you're going to put them in a shoe, just check it out first. You don't end up on the uh, on the beach wherever you're going to paddle and just can't get your footwear on. So think about your feet in the winter. Right. Hands. So I mentioned about short fingered gloves earlier for some people who've got fairly you know get good circulation short fingered gloves are pretty good because they just leave your fingers nice and free to feel the paddle but you've got a bit of neoprene in here so a short fingered glove like this one the clutch is a, is a good choice for some folk i find in the winter that gets just a bit cold for me so i then stretch to a um a full finger glove like this one there's loads of good gloves around so you can try them out the only thing i'm sure many of you have found is as you get thicker and thicker with the glove it's much hard, harder to hold the paddle so we start looking at things like these ones which are a near flex it's quite thin but it has a has a grippy backing on on the on the palm area so it doesn't feel like you're holding too much um, and you can still hold the paddle and grip but you stay warm but my personal favorite are these ones and this is the talon mitt. And the reason I like it is that when I put it on, it's a mitt. So I can keep my fingers going together, keep them nice and warm. But when I turn around, yabba dabba do, I've got open palms so I can grip the paddle. I've got loads of grip in there. I can feel what I'm doing. And I can then, if I want to, just cinch that back, which is what I quite often do. I can move and feel my hands, but if I'm feeling a bit colder, I can just pull that over. I can just have it resting. So it's holding, holding the back of my wrist, keeping that nice and warm. You don't get that wind chill across the back of your wrist here. So your hands go cold or I just flip it over, put my hand back inside. So that's the talon mitt. And um, yeah, this is my go to winter paddling glove, to be honest with you. It's, um, it's a win win for me. Um, open palm mitts. You get closed palm versions of the same things as well without the opening. But personally, I've always found the opening ones that the best for paddling. Um, what about your head in the winter? Well, a couple of choices, really. Um, you've got full neoprene hoods, pretty familiar with surf style. We cut ours a slightly bit shorter because we're not necessarily integrating them underneath a, a wetsuit. We cut them a little bit shorter and that means they work better with paddling jackets. Um, but it's similar technology. This one here is a Neoflex. So this is a 0.5 millimeter neoprene hood. The beauty of a hood is you can also use it a bit like a snood. So I'm going to just give you a demonstration. If it's cold, put it up over your head. But if it's a bit warmer, just drop it down. You've got yourself a nice warm neck in there. You can stay insulated. And if you need to flick it up, cover your ears. You may not look very fashionable, but you're going to be comfortable. So that's the main thing with one of those. Other one, just simply have a hat, any sort of fleecy hat. Probably, you know, big bobble hat if that gets wet may not be as good. So think about think about your materials again in there, but make sure you've got a hat that keeps you insulated. Believe it or not, you don't actually lose as much heat from your head as they sort of all profess. But nonetheless, you do want to keep a warm head. And also for wind chill and things in your ears, you don't get sort of that kind of biting wind going in. And that can affect you, particularly if, you know, like me, you've had surfers ear. It's um, making sure your ears are protected is, is actually pretty important. So a good hat to keep you nice and warm and you can stuff that away. And then the other thing that's really kind of come to light, I mean, you saw these on the ski slopes for many years, but they're actually becoming really popular in paddling. It's just simply a neck scarf like this one. So we make this one out of um, marine recycled material, um, which is our neck scarf, but you can bring that up. It's got lots of versatility, have it as a neck scarf, use it as a headband or twist it up if you want and just make a hat. And now the beauty of something like this, is that you can then just stuff it into a pocket, stuff, stuff it inside the top of your jacket like this one and just pull it out when you need it. So little versatile pieces like that. So hands, feet, head. In the winter, you need to make sure those bits are really, really warm. Okay, finally then, let's just talk about winter. Again, I'm just gonna remind everyone 
I would not be seen paddling in the winter without a PFD on because if you fall in the water you've definitely no matter how healthy you are there is a risk of cold water shock so you need to make sure that you've got something in on you that if you fall in it's going to support you it's going to let you get that moment where you breathe you have a little panic and then you relax and you get back to your board and you get back on so an inherent foam pfd is your friend in the winter definitely definitely wear one of these i i, I mean i know there's some dialogue in, in stand-up paddling about when you do and don't wear a buoyancy aid i've been to paddling since I was nine years old and I've never really paddled without a buoyancy aid so for me it's just I always wear a buoyancy aid and I was I was pretty shocked to see a picture online this morning and it's someone who's just gone out about dawn they're on their board there's the sun coming up they're sort of having a hot drink and you know it's the middle of winter brilliant they're out paddling but they've got a dry bag attached to their back they're wearing I'm, I'm not sure what jacket and their buoyancy is under the straps of their board it's not going to help save you Barney spends his days designing equipment that will save you so please wear a buoyancy especially in the winter now it can benefit you as well because you get one like this which has got a pocket in it you can put your phone in there you can put that hat in there so you put a hydration bladder in the back so think about the insulation think about your safety it can protect you please wear a buoyancy Okay, finally, for winter, I would be definitely taking some bits and pieces with me in a dry bag that is going to make the day um, better. Uh, if something was to happen, it's just going to protect me a little bit more. So if I'm wearing my dry pants, it might be my jacket that I was talking about that I put in there. It could be something like this one, just the Terek, which folds away really light. I'd have myself a drink in a bottle. It could be a hot drink, or you could just have an insulated uh, drinks bottle like this. Um, I chuck my downy in here. Now you may not want a down jacket in there, but definitely something that you can just stick on that's just going to get you warm really quickly if you get back to the shore. Um, I've got another one of these fleecy beanie hats. If I need to give that to someone else, just get them warm. You can put your hands and wrap hands and things like that in there to just try and warm up. If you have to warm up really quickly because you've got wet and cold, um, I've got a torch because this time of year, certainly up where I'm, you know, the dark comes really quickly. You're out at three o'clock and four o'clock, it's dark. I know the days are getting lighter, thank goodness, but think about a torch to take along with you. you may want to think about a basic first aid kit. I've got myself a, another pair of just thin gloves, so I can just, if I need to get my hands warm, I can put them in. They're not waterproof, they're nothing like that, but they're just gonna get my hands in there, let my hands dry maybe as well. That's really important, so my hands will get warm again. And then finally, in this one, I've just got a bivy bag, but it could just be a silver blanket, just something if you need to, to wrap up, shelter down, hunker down and just get really warm. So Ben might come in with a few more kind of comments on what else you might want to look in kit that's not just paddling kit, but just some safety kit in that respect a little bit later. But um, that's what I'd have in my dry bag, some of those bits as well. So, you know, be prepared for the fact that if you're in the water or someone in your paddling has gone in the water, it's got really cold, you may need to protect them for a little bit. And if it's cold water temperatures, you're going to chill really quickly. Wind chill massively affects how people's temperature goes. If someone's had the immersion in there and they've got cold water shot, you need to just get them warm. Hypothermia can come on quite slowly. And as we all know, the risk of it are massive. So you, as a group or as an individual, just need to be prepared to sort of protect yourself a little bit. So look, just to kind of run back through a few things, I've, I've gone at a pretty rapid pace through a lot of gear for you. So let's just uh, recap and I'll work my way back through the winter and just, just say, think about protecting your legs, make sure you've got a good insulated sort of covering of a jacket, maybe think about how those join to keep you, keep you warm or a bib. Definitely make sure you've got good base layers and something you can pull on and off so you can uh, moderate your temperature. Think about your head, think about your hands, think about your feet, all the extremities are going to get cold, but keep your core warm in the winter and wear a buoyancy aid. Have some safety gear with you. Shoulder season, a bit more adaptable. You could be a bit more flexible with your equipment, but think about wind chill still in, in the shoulder seasons, especially the spring, because the spring's the hard one. It's a sunny day, you're wearing your t-shirt, but on the water, or if you've gone in the water, things are definitely a bit different. The water temperature is not warm at that point. So think about that with your shoulder season gear, that, that spring gear that you're looking at buying or getting hold of to paddle in um, and still think about a few protective pieces, but a bit more adaptable at that time. So I guess I've whistled through that. 
Um, I hope you've been able to keep up. Um, we try and kind of produce various sort of bits of information. We've got a good video by Cal Major talking about the kit that she's used that you can have a look out for. The guys from Water Skills Academy, of course, really good fonts of information because they're out using the kit all the time. I think probably what would be worthwhile now is see if um, you guys have got some questions for us and we can help just either go back over a few bits or also just add a bit more. Thanks, Paul. That was uh, absolutely superb. Ne nearly an hour, believe it or not. That's um, <laughs> extremely thorough and um, uh, massive thanks to Barney as well. We, um, but Barney more than me, have been tapping away answering um, all the questions that have been flying in. We hope that um, you know we've we've answered them all. Um, some of the common themes are around um, you know wetsuits and then paddling. Um, you know, in, in, as you say, in the shoulder scenes where it might be a bit breezy, there might be a bit of a chill in the air. Um, one of the things that we'd, we'd say is, that, you know, you've, if you've got your wetsuit, that's brilliant. Just um, a, a windproof jacket over the top will, uh, will do wonders. Just keeping that chill off you, it's absolutely um, key. And um, again, like Paul said, you don't have to go out and buy, um, you know, a specialist jacket. If you've got a windproof jacket, then that works um, just fine until, you know, maybe you... you, you um, want to get out a bit more and you think right I'm going to start investing in some specific kit um, personally um, just just one of the things that Paul said I find whilst I, I do wear a dry suit I really find the splits with a bib and a jacket over the top work really well for me most of the obviously not in the summer uh, but most of the year round is really versatile and they work um, often I don't paddle with the jacket on just a um, like a thermal short short sleeve thermal underneath, and um, they, they're great for keeping you um, keeping you dry when you're stand you know standing on a bank back on your board maybe up to your knees with the um, with the socks on as well. So um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think um, certainly the the one of the key points I guess for paddling in the winter is this cold water shock. Now um, I. I I, I try and swim most mornings um, and I'd like to think I'm, I'm pretty used to, uh, well, I was down to about four degrees at the moment where I swim. But every time I go into the water, I, I do get a gasp of, um, you know, it does take my breath away and produces that shock. Now, I mean, I'm used to have swum like that for, for a number of years. Now, even if I fell off a board at this time of year and it didn't have the right kit on, then I know that um, quite quickly I would be um, I, I would be in a, in, a um, in some serious trouble. Now there's some great information out there. There's a there's a superb video, and I'll put it in the email at the end called um, "Cold Water Shock uh, 1101. and it's about how the body reacts uh, to cold water immersion. So basically, that first minute is key to getting your breath under control. Now to help you get that breath and your breathing under control a PFD sort of gets you halfway there because it keeps you up and out of the water and allows you to breathe normally. So that's why we'd, uh, we'd always recommend um, a, a especially a foam block PFD in, um, in the winter. So something that I'll, I'll put some information out on later. Um, I think, to be honest, I think we've answered most of the questions. I would like to think Barney's been typing away. So it's been brilliant. Um, loads of... Uh, you know, loads of questions, lots of information back, which is which is great. Um, a couple of things. So if you're looking at uh, some more information on PFDs and leashes, head to the WSA YouTube channel. Paul and I did a discussion on that, um, I think, in either in the first or the second lockdown. It's it's free to watch. They're, they're all there for you. Um, and we also did one on sub safety, which looked at um, a little bit of planning and, and how to keep ourselves and our friends safe on the water. So again, that's free. Um, if you um, want to just, you know, a bit of lockdown learning, online learning, we've got a great um, course which takes a couple of hours to do. It's called Ice Up Smart. I've put the link in the chat and it talks from everything about kit to weather to planning, tides, all, all sorts of stuff. So that, that's available as well. Um, and in addition to that, obviously, we've got a selection of courses. They're not running now, but hopefully they'll be running um, as soon as we can in the spring. So um, I've just, there's one question that's just come in. Uh, so I have a, a separate, uh, separate, so pants and jacket. Um, the 
uh, it has integrated feet but doesn't have an inner liner at the waist. Is this an issue? Uh, no, in, in a word. The only thing I would say is, as I mentioned, is that we've made um, non twin waist pants, but as long as you get a good cinch, basically, and really what you, you probably find if it's a paddling pant, it'll be a thicker neoprene belt across here and it'll have a good cinch around the waist. So, as I demonstrated with these ones, I'll have to sort of show you. If I just push that down so you don't see the, the second waist, you're left then with this neoprene middle section, it's a big Velcro piece, cinch that up, cinch that up. It's got grippy elastic on the inside, so it just helps it stay up. So providing it's got a good system of holding up. Now, worst case scenario, go and look out for a pair of braces that you can just attach to it. But what you want is something that stops it flooding with water so it seals and dragging down because if it's got the if it's got the socks in and water floods in then it, it can be dangerous so you want something that just lets you create as tight a seal around the waist as you can with that so that's that's what i'd advise okay great thanks thanks for that paul um so i guess as i say i think we've um we, we've answered most things big big thanks in the chat to to you paul and um and to barney which is great um the so a couple of things before we, before we finish. Um, this evening we've launched um, a women's sub collective tour, and that that'll be a, a tour visiting certain venues throughout the UK in the spring and summer. There's small meetups, so there's going to be no more than thirty people, uh, thirty ladies attending. Um, it's on our. It's just been uh, posted on our Facebook and our Instagram. So please um, have a look at that. If you um, we're always up for um, improving. So if there's an area where we haven't visited or is not on the list, let us know through info at Water Skills Academy, and we'll um, we'll certainly do our very best this year or certainly next year to um, uh, to do to get to that area. The big news on that is we've we're really proud to have partnered with Palm and Starboard Boards on, on this project um, on the tour. So um, massive thanks uh, to, to Paul and Barney for that. Um, Okay, so the last but one thing is in two weeks time, we've got a webinar by a gentleman called Chris Hines. Now, Chris Hines was one of the original founders of Surface Against Sewage. He was the environmental consultant on the Eden Project. Um, and he has um, done environmental consultancy all over the world. Please, if you can join us for that uh, webinar and tell your friends about it, it's absolutely free. It's really important as outdoor people that we, um, we, we listen and learn from, from people like Chris and we can spread the word about you know, our, our environment and our environmentalism. So um, big, big, uh, big that one up in a couple of weeks. Um, so I guess finally, uh, massive thanks to Paul and Barney. Um, wonderful stuff and uh, if you've got any questions send them to info at and we'll try and get them answered but until the next time thanks a lot guys really appreciate it see you guys bye